Okay, everybody, let's get started. Uh, we're happy to be hosting Joel Thornton today. Uh, Joel is a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of Washington. He received his PhD in 2002 from the University of California, Berkeley, and then he was a postdoctoral fellow from 2002 to 2004 at the University of Toronto. Um, his research, I'm not a good public speaker. Um, his research focuses on the understanding of the atmospheric chemistry of reactive nitrogen and organic compounds with an emphasis on um, or, uh, aerosol formation and uh, multiphase chemistry. His group uses a combination of mass spectrometry, method and instrumentation development, laboratory process studies, in situ observations, and modeling. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joel and uh, listen to his talk. Okay, thanks very much. I was told if I'm gonna wander, I have to wear this microphone, so. And I like to wander. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much for the invitation, uh, John and John. I, uh, for uh, being able to come and talk about the winter campaign, um, which was, stands for Wintertime Investigation of Transport, Emissions, and Reactivity. And uh, that was a campaign that was uh, really the brainchild of Steve Brown and myself. Um, Steve's here somewhere. And uh, Patrick Veras from NOAA uh, was the one who actually came up with a very good acronym, uh, improved upon an acronym that I came up with, which we <laughs> shall not mention, um, or I'm told I'm not allowed to mention it anyways. Uh, and you know, ultimately, the, the big question that I might tell uh, non-scientists what we were trying to figure out in this campaign was what happens to air pollution uh, in the winter. And by winter, we mean periods where it tends to be colder than average, uh, or colder than uh, the summer, darker than the summer. Uh, because much of our activities in terms of understanding uh, air pollution has had a, at least in the US, an emphasis on summertime photochemical oxidation and the, the formation of ozone and, and secondary aerosol during, uh, through photochemistry, but you don't have that in the wintertime as this uh, logo is meant to evoke where we have, um, see, NO2 columns from space merged onto a, a map of uh, nighttime city lights over the United States. Um, so a little bit of motivation. I don't think I have to do too much for this audience, but um, wintertime air quality is, uh, you know, is not as maybe severe as intense, or it hadn't been as severe and intense as photo, the photochemical smog of urban areas uh, in the summertime. But what I'm showing you here uh, is PM 2.5 uh, speciation and abundance in micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, measured by EPA sites uh, on the eastern half of the United States. Uh, in 2007 and 2015, summertime, and 2007, 2015, wintertime. And what you'll notice now is that actually the mean wintertime PM2.5 abundance at these sites is actually higher than the wintertime. Uh, sorry, the, the higher than the summertime, suggesting now that actually from an exposure perspective, wintertime has become worse than summertime, at least to the extent that these two years or these years are representative, 2015. And what you'll also notice is that um, this shift in speciation between summertime and wintertime hasn't changed a whole lot. You get to a higher abundance of sulfate in the summertime than in the wintertime, although uh, basically that's replaced with a higher contribution from nitrate. And what I'm going to talk about today is actually trying to you know, this is the motivation for why we should understand the transformations of primary pollutants into secondary pollutants like PM2.5 in the form of sulfate and nitrate in the wintertime. The motivation is here um, for understanding winter relative to summer. And what we'll learn is that this is a tightly coupled system, sulfate influencing nitrate, and that you can't think about the formation of secondary organic aeros uh, secondary aerosol, um, inorganic aerosol in particular, without understanding the multiphase chemistry uh, that's happening in the gas phase as well. So this is a, a tightly coupled system between the gas and particle phases. And the upshot of that is that actually we don't understand that chemistry as well as we should or would like to. 
Um, <clears throat> so another way of looking about why would we do the winter campaign, of course, the emissions of the primary pollutants are occurring for the most part year-round. You do have shifts in the source mix. I'll talk about that a little bit going forward. But you also have a large change in the chemical processing that takes place. Um, it is darker, um, it is colder, so you get a shift towards multiphase chemistry being relatively more important compared to the free radical photochemical oxidation chemistry that we're more used to from summertime studies. Um, and <clears throat> once it in involves the multiphase chemistry, this is an area that, um, because it involves aerosol particles as a substrate for reactivity, um, those are complicated in terms of their composition, and the actual reaction processes are not as well understood at, um, at a mechanistic level, so quantifying them or, or at least parameterizing them for use in models has been a challenge. Um, as well, uh, as I mentioned, the colder temperatures um, of wintertime would thermodynamically favor converting gases into particles, so if secondary organic aerosols, I showed you, might be a motivation from an exposure perspective um, uh, in the wintertime. We need to understand the coupling between the multiphase chemical processing, which might be the source of secondary organic aerosol, and how it might connect to the shift in the emissions of the primary pollutants, such as ammonia being different in wintertime from summertime, um, the emissions of sulfate or uh, sulfur dioxide and NOx possibly changing uh, from summer to winter, and so on. And that was the goal of winter, is to really try and understand that coupling between the emissions the shifts in the different types of emissions where you don't have a biosphere um, source of isoprene uh, affecting perhaps the fate of NOx. You don't necessarily have the same level of oxidants um, affecting the lifetime of sulfur dioxide and uh, its conversion to sulfate and so on. Um, and that type of coupling had not really been studied in detail, uh, at least not since the early 2000s, and there's been large shifts in the emissions of primary pollutants as well as the source contributions of those the source mix of those emissions. So that's why we set out uh, with the winter campaign uh, using this, the NCAR C-130. Um, <clears throat> talk about what went on there, but we had a, um, a goal or an objective really to study the dark processes um, with as much of an equal focus as we could convince uh, the pilots and crew to fly on a nighttime type schedule. Uh, so you can see here are um, shown in a solar a, a zenith angle type uh, coloring, where anything past this line is, is basically dark, and um, into the late night, uh, early morning periods, and then this is daytime. So we had a pretty even distribution between day and night flying. Actually, the hours of flights were essentially 50% at night. Um, and most of that was focused in the lowest one kilometer of the atmosphere to focus on the pollution, in part because the transport mechanisms in wintertime also are somewhat different than in summertime, less convective, local convective activity and more uh, transport in a somewhat stable uh, boundary layer uh, and long range horizontal transport out over the ocean. So uh, we had, um, as I mentioned, several goals of trying to understand that PM 2.5 budget. Uh, so understanding sources of nitrate, so a big focus on reactive nitrogen chemistry and the components that undergo multi-phase processing um, with nitrogen. And uh, so that was a major focus of our payload. Uh, we also had um, an aerosol mass spectrometer, as well as um, a pills to measure soluble um, aerosol composition, um, because we were thinking about interactions of uh, trace gases with sea spray, as well as with sulfate, ammonium, nitrate, aerosol. Um, and those two instruments uh, provide essentially complementary measurements of the aerosol systems in that regard. Uh, those are a pretty comprehensive set of uh, trace gas measurements involving reactive nitrogen and oxidant sources, as we'll see later on in the talk. And then we had um, modeling uh, using a nested grid version of GeoSchem operated by Liat Jaegle at UW. And I'm going to basically show um, in my talk everything in the context of GeoSCAM interpretation of the data today. Um, <clears throat> but we also had it operating in forecast mode uh, during the campaign to help us determine when we should fly and where we should fly, along with um, support from uh, NOAA and uh, some flex part simulations. The campaign ran um, in 2015, February 1st through March 13th. Uh, and I think I'll leave that as is for now. It was winter, and it was cold, and it was 
not your normal winter and not your normal cold either. Um, and that has some, of course, that's the way field campaigns go, I'm told. Uh, so whenever you set out to do something, it's going to be slightly different than what you hope for in terms of the uh, comparison uh, of what is typical wintertime conditions. So I need to thank all the science team that made this happen, um, especially leadership uh, Steve Brown, Leon J. Glay, Ron Cohen, Jose Jimenez, Rodney Weber, and Jack Dibb. Um, and then, of course, all the students and postdocs that worked with us on this campaign. And I'll, I decided not to highlight individual folks. Uh, most of what I'll be talking about has uh, been either the product of myself and Felipe Lopez Hilfiker, Liat Jagle, or Viral uh, Shaw. Uh, most of the meat of the conclusions I'm going to draw, but none of those could have been drawn without all of these folks working on the campaign. And of course, the NCAR, um, RAF, ACOM, uh, crew, and so on were essential. So I'm going to break this up into three parts, give you a little flavor. I'm not going to dig in too deep into any one particular topic here, but um, try to give you a flavor of what's coming out of the winter campaign in terms of science. So I'll give you some uh, insights into the emissions, what we think, um, some insights we've gained from emissions, chemical conversion, uh, and then uh, the aerosol composition and uh, evolution. So in terms of emissions uh, during winter, of course, the biosphere has largely shut down, at least through the northern half of the uh, eastern United States. Um, we don't have uh, wildfires for the most part. Um, there are some controlled agricultural burns or agricultural burns in the southern part of the domain, um, but those are generally small. Um, so we're largely left with a mix of transportation, uh, point sources, um, you know, power plants, and residential heating, and some agriculture, although that's... Um, an uncertain one in terms of, say, for example, the source of ammonia um, that we're going to come back to, because that plays an important role in setting um, secondary aerosol formation from nitric acid in the formation of nit uh, ammonium nitrate. And just to give you some feeling, from the last time this type of study had been done, there have been large trends now in sources of sulfur dioxide and NOx over time. And so this was another motivation for going back to the eastern US and doing a survey of this area um, to try and understand how has the chemistry shifted over time? And I'm going to ask you to think a little bit at the end how this might change, um, for example, aerosol loadings going forward in the future up into the mid-2020s with these uh, declines projected to continue. So one thing we can do with the, the data is ask how well are our emissions inventories at um, explaining our, or uh, how accurate are they um, using the observations of uh, nitrogen oxides uh, and sulfur dioxide uh, from the winter campaign. These are the flight tracks shown here. And then um, underneath them is a map showing the national emissions inventory, NEI inventory that's used in GeosChem uh, for NOx emissions and sulfur dioxide emissions. And this is the breakdown in the NEI inventory um, of the different source mixes here. That's not so important for this talk, but if you take um, the total reactive nitrogen measurements from winter and you compare them point by point on the flight track to uh, GeosChem um, predictions of total reactive nitrogen, which will be a surrogate uh, for NOx uh, if there's <coughs> limited wet scavenging and, and dry deposition, um, and you get quite good um, agreement uh, on average over the whole campaign. We'll look into detail at some specific flights as well. In both um, total reactive nitrogen, so therefore NOx emissions and sulfur dioxide emissions as well. Um, so it's not like the inventories are way off by factors of two or three. Um, and, and in some cases, in summertime studies, there have been factors of two biases between GSChem and nitrogen oxide um, observations. So this suggests that we can then use the model to understand what the evolution um, of NOx and SO2 are over the domain of the model and not be too concerned with having um, the biases being due to emissions, but rather learning about what has to be right in the chemistry to bring agreement between model and measurements. Um, in contrast, we can look at um, formaldehyde and ammonia in the same context. And formaldehyde we'll find is important um, as a potential source of radicals to drive uh, photochemistry during the daytime. And um, the observations 
were generally underestimated by, underestimated by the model uh, by factors of um, two or so. Uh, in the similar um, but opposite sense, um, the ammonia, which is important for aerosols, uh, was actually overestimated by the model. And uh, it turns out that fixing this is, these, these biases is actually important for getting both understanding the oxidation chemistry as well as aerosol formation, or at least the thermodynamic prediction of aerosol formation, correct. <clears throat> um, and this is where we come back to the fact that 2015 wasn't normal. Um, so it was one of the coldest years, coldest winters in that portion of the US um, on record. And that then helps us learn about perhaps temperature dependent emissions in the form of ammonia, say from um, uh, from agriculture, which we would expect to have a temperature dependence. And then perhaps uh, we don't know why formaldehyde um, was too low. That could be an indication of the chemistry being incorrect in the model because formaldehyde is a, is a photochemical oxidation product. Um, but there's always been this long running question about whether or not there is direct emissions of formaldehyde from inefficient combustion um, in engines and maybe cold starts during winter is, is a way that you might have enhanced formaldehyde emissions that are not in the inventory. Um, so we can use um, some existing parameterizations of ammonia emissions with the temperature dependence in the model. And you can actually, if you incorporate the, that dependence with the 2015 winter uh, mean temperature, you find actually that that brings the model into pretty good agreement. So this is total ammonia. It's not measuring direct ammonia emissions. But under the winter campaign conditions, it turned out almost all the ammonia was in the form of ammonium uh, nitrate or ammonium sulfate in the aerosol that was therefore recorded and measured by the AMS. So this is a, a reasonable estimate of the ammonia emissions, at least over the domain of the winter campaign. And um, while we don't know the mechanism for why it would be underestimating formaldehyde, um, we just have a couple of questions. But what um, we find can work is simply scaling the emissions inventory values for formaldehyde that exist by a factor of five. And that gives actually not only average agreement, but also spatial agreement as well. I'm not showing that here. So that would suggest that it is something tied to emissions. It could be emissions of um, short-lived VOCs that produce formaldehyde fairly quickly in the winter. Um, and formaldehyde has a, a several hour lifetime. So that might be enough um, of an explanation. It doesn't have to be direct emissions of formaldehyde, but something that transforms fairly quickly under the wintertime conditions into formaldehyde. Um, so in the context of this campaign, it was also a way for uh, my group, um, as, um, as well as others, to try out some new instrumentation or improvements to our instrumentation. And uh, so Felipe Lopez Hilfiger, who's a graduate student in my group, flew our time of flight chemical ionization mass spectrometer um, that we had a maiden voyage, if you will, on a, a NOAA campaign on the P3. This was its first voyage on the C-130. And we had made some, a lot of changes to it um, in between those, those two campaigns. I just wanted to talk a little bit about it because uh, I think it's now enabling a whole lot of new chemistry studies that we can do um, based on some of the features that I, I'll, I'll mention. So we use um, iodide adduct ionization, and we've been um, really trying to understand this uh, for several years now in this context of a time of flight instrument. And what's important about the time of flight instrument is the simultaneous acquisition of the entire mass spectrum, um, essentially, in real time. So at two hertz, you're measuring um, across the entire mass spectrum from a, 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 say, 30 atomic mass units out to 500 or so. And you get that. Uh, we do it at two hertz, but there's no reason we couldn't do it at 10 hertz. The, the limitation is actually just data stream. Um, and <clears throat> that duty cycle then allows us to have very high precision as we go into and out of plumes and being able to diagnose um, fast changes, spatial changes, and temporal changes in the chemistry and the composition, which in a con situation like winter where things are not necessarily as well mixed and the plumes are not um, large in spatial extent sometimes has been really useful for diagnosing emissions of uh, various trace gases from point sources, as I'll show you. So we were focusing on the measurements of several reactive nitrogen species, nitrile chloride, N2O5, nitric acid, HONO, as well as several halogen-containing species. And not during winter, but um, this instrument has also been used to study multifunctional organics as well. <clears throat> 
And you can actually do these all simultaneously. And just to give you a feeling for that, um, so here is HCL and SO2, uh, that uh, time series as we transected a, a power plant plume uh, on research flight seven. You can see there's a very tight correlation between sulfur dioxide and HCL, and I think this was using a NOAA SO2 measurement, although we now measure SO2, we now know we measure SO2 by this comparison we were able to do on the aircraft um, with the, the mass spec as well. Um, and you see the um, spatial correlation between SO2 and HCL, which basically tells us that HCL is coming from a power plant. And this has been something that we are working on and trying to generalize this, um, how many power plants, what type of power plants are sources of HCL, because this will be a source of reactive chlorine um, away from the ocean in, inland, and that's a, something we've been looking for uh, since our observations of um, nitrile chloride, uh, actually just up the road from here, um, with, with Steve a few years ago. <clears throat> and what I wanted to point out here on this slide is that you know, in the power plant plume, what gets drowned out actually is this non-zero background of HCL that we saw th you know, um, well inland on this flight, suggesting that there is a supply of HCL that is beyond uh, what we would think is as typical from uh, being from sea spray. So you can go really down uh, into the power of the instrument and plot other halogens and what's where the power really becomes obvious is in the re resolving power of the instrument being able to separate peaks that might be contaminants. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but you also get simultaneous acquisition of all the isotopomers of any halogen that it can measure. And that gives you basically a molecular fingerprint um, at the two hertz time scale so that there's no way that you would have some set of masses that are perfectly correlated with the isotopic distribution of uh, bromine chloride and all these peaks all are perfectly correlated together. So that is like a spectroscopic fingerprint um, that you have now in a mass spectrometer in real time. So I think it's going to open up a lot of new science uh, in the halogen world as well as the organic world. Um, and so I should mention that this is bromine compounds coming out of a power plant uh, and this has become an interesting topic because uh, some power plants are adding bromine additives to the um, uh, the flu basically to scavenge mercury. And there's a, a significant amount of interest to understand what fraction of the bromine they're adding is actually coming out of the power plant. And that's one of the um, features of winter that we're able to comment on. <clears throat> okay, so now I wanna use the fact basically that we think we have a pretty good handle on the emissions of say the big players, NOx and SO2, as well as ammonia. Um, and to start thinking about how well um, our processes like the multiphase chemistry of N205 represented in a, in a model like GeosChem. Um, so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on, on this because I'm sure most of you are familiar with it, but during the winter time, you know, it's estimated that um, half or even two thirds um, of the NOx emitted is actually oxidized uh, to nitric acid via multiphase chemistry of N205 in the eastern United States. So it's a, it represents a large fate of the NOx that's emitted uh, <clears throat> into that region. And um, models trying to actually accurately predict the distribution of ammonium nitrate in the wintertime, the, the, the abundance of ammonium nitrate aerosol, uh, and a spatial distribution have had a very hard time, GSChem in particular, um, of getting that right, overestimating um, aerosol nitrate by factors of three or so. And one possible reason would be that this chemistry is not incorporated into the model. So in order to do that, you have to understand the efficiency with which N2O5 reacts on aerosol particles. And aerosol particles are, of course, complex mixtures of organic material, inorganic material, and they have um, uncertain water content. And now we've added into this an added complexity of if they have chloride, then the product branching also changes, not just the rate. And uh, this winter campaign represents, you know, re represented a, a great way to test this chemistry. I think the, um, the payload that we flew was, you know, not surprisingly, since Steve and I were uh, organizing it, focused on getting this right, you know, at least testing this as best we could. <clears throat> um, and so what we're gonna do is, uh, walk through this chemistry a little bit, give you a flavor for what we observed, and then think about how well the model's doing. Uh, and this, I, um, I took this slide from Aaron McDuffie, 
hoping that she would be in the audience. And um, what, you know, what we observed, and maybe isn't too surprising, was a wide variety of um, regimes that this chemistry can undergo. So you can have a situation where the reaction probability uh, for N2O5 is very low, and N2O5 just doesn't react on the aerosol that's present, or there's very low aerosol there. Um, either way, N2O5 would build up, and the products would not uh, be present. And so we certainly had a flight that demonstrated that characteristic. Um, you could have a situation where N2O5 was reacting fairly efficiently and mostly down a pathway that made only nitric acid. <clears throat> and that was a situation we observed on one of these flights, I would say counterintuitively, over the ocean. Um, because we would expect that there would be a branching to nitro chloride if there was sea spray pl present providing chloride. And we, in fact, on other flights, we do see that where you get essentially into a five reacting efficiently and the branching essentially going to nitro chloride and nitric acid. And I'll explain a little bit later why we want to know that branching quite well. But that's going to be a real challenge for models to get right. Um, the models are not only having to simulate the right emissions of NOx, the conversion into N2O5, um, the efficiency of its reaction on the aerosol, meaning they have to get the aerosol composition right to understand what the reaction probability might be, um, as well as the product branching. So the default model in GSCAM, um, and I've done a little work on this in the past with uh, Becky Alexander, um, and now we're doing it with the winter campaign data as a constraint uh, with Liat. Um, the default model, and this is not, I would say, unique to GSCAM either, and it really depends on how they parameterize this. Sometimes it's been done very simply in a model, and sometimes it's, it's it's not even connected to aerosol processing and to a five fate. So you can have a whole different array of behaviors on a model for nighttime processing. And that's, again, a, a major reason why we wanted to do the winter campaign was to put some constraints down on something that represents half of the NOx's fate. <clears throat> so um, the default GSCAM, as I was explaining, um, is overestimating the total amount of nitrate, nitric acid, and particulate nitrate in the gas phase um, by factors of two to three. And the distribution compared to the observations of um, reactive nitrogen is also very different. So they're very low N2O5, whereas the observations on average have quite a bit of N2O5 at night. Most of that N2O5 has been pushed into nitric acid, and there's relatively little nitric acid. Um, I should say this is total nitric acid plus particulate nitrate, uh, and so on. So there's a real problem with the, the reactants and products of N2O5 in GeoSchem. So one thing we did was to uh, take some existing literature parameterizations that my group has put forward um, for explaining the efficiency with which N2O5 reacts on aerosol and how that efficiency depends on composition. Um, and uh, this is showing you here that this is not um, new. We, we were not the first to discover that the reaction probability of N2O5, its efficiency of uptake, depends on the nitrate content of the aerosol. We just mapped it out a little bit more. Uh, and then we have shown that the reaction probability depends um, quite strongly on the organic fraction of the aerosol. So the model is going to have to get the nitrate content of the aerosol right, as well as the organic fraction right, in order to come close uh, to getting uh, the reaction probability, at least in well-controlled laboratory studies, what we think it does. And that's part of the issue is that we don't even have field constraints in here. Um, this is just pure laboratory studies. Um, that we're going to base most of this um, improvement to GeoSchem on. So when we do incorporate these dependencies, we find that the new model um, has a reaction probability that's decreased by a factor of three from its sort of default. Um, <clears throat> and that then changes the amount of N2O5 that is reacting into nitric acid and helps lower the overprediction over of nitric acid that the model was making. So this is an example from one flight. Uh, this is the first flight we made. Um, leaving our base, Langley, Virginia, and then we, or Hampton, Virginia, and uh, going out to survey the, ultimately the outflow of New York City, but we were making some stops along the way to try and capture a couple of different plumes coming off from Philadelphia, New York City, and DC. And as night set in, uh, partway through the flight, N2O5 started to accumulate. The black is the observations. 
Um, and in the old model, we were underestimating the N2O5. Um, we were also underestimating nitro chloride and overestimating, as I showed you, nitric acid and particulate nitrate. And now with the new version of the reaction probability parameterization, we brought the N2O5 into pretty good agreement with the observations. The nitric acid and total nitrate has come down uh, in the right direction, but is still um, overestimating the observations, and nitro chloride um, is <coughs> marginally improved, and that's because we haven't focused on that side of the parameterization uh, in these studies. Okay. So we did a pretty good job just fixing the description of this chemistry based on the observations um, from winter as a constraint. And <coughs> the one other fix that we made uh, was that the dry deposition of nitric acid was based on a parameterization um, from Wesley and Hicks that essentially has a threshold dependence in temperature. If the temperature gets below a certain value, basically the deposition velocity of nitric acid goes to zero. And probably a bit extreme. Maybe you can understand why that would happen. As you get colder, you get it stably stratified, and so vertical mixing is suppressed, and so the deposition velocity should get lower but maybe not go to zero. So this was fixed in the model as well, and those two fixes basically brought the agreement, uh, brought good agreement between the observations and the model over the you know, whole domain. Um, I'll show you some more examples of this later. But now, for the first time, GeosChem, um, and the GeosChem is just one model, but this model is actually doing a fairly good job representing total nitrate, uh, nitric acid and particulate nitrate. Um, and so the partitioning has gone from you know, overweighting the conversion of N2O5 into nitric acid to slowing down that uptake rate and then actually getting rid of some extra nitric acid through dry deposition. And that has implications for understanding the impact of wintertime pollution on ecosystems as well, since nitrate deposition is a potential means of excess nutrient supply. OK, so I'm going to connect this. Um, process now to secondary aerosol formation since N2O5 conversion on aerosols is a major potential source of nitric acid. Um, and I just showed you that we, the model wasn't getting that correctly initially. And now we're going to think more quantitatively about secondary aerosol formation in the form of sulfate and nitrate because nitrate depends very strongly on getting the sulfate correct. Um, okay, so just some very hand wavy basic um, expectations for inorganic, secondary organic aerosol, and organic aerosol in general. So, um, what we're talking about in nitric acid partitioning into the aerosol to become ammonium nitrate, you know, this is essentially a process that's going to depend on the water content and therefore, and also the pH, the acidity. That will affect the equilibrium constants for nitric acid uh, in particular, which um, is not as strong of an acid as sulfuric acid. And so for ammonium nitrate, what we're expecting is that as aerosol pH goes up, so the aerosols become less acidic, we would get higher and higher partitioning of nitric acid into the particle phase, so the fraction of nitric acid in the particle phase is Fp here. Um, but if you have a fixed aerosol pH, then having a higher humidity would also drive nitric acid into the aerosol. Decreasing temperature would also drive nitric acid in the aerosol. And th these thermodynamics are, have largely been worked out in the laboratory. Um, and we're going to test the observations from winter against those thermodynamic expectations. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about organics today. Um, it's just a whole different story. Uh, but there is a. Um, an expectation that because you don't have a lot of photochemical processing in the winter, that you would not have a lot of secondary organic aerosol formation, since that depends on the oxidative processing of um, organics. So that would be slower. But of course, it's colder temperatures, so the, what you do process would have a higher uh, preference for being partitioned into the aerosol phase to make secondary organic aerosol. But this is what um, is in the National Emissions Inventory. Um, for organic aerosol sources, so we're expecting that it would be less secondary compared to some are more primary, so residential wood combustion and so on. But that's an interesting story developing from winter uh, that um, I'm going to leave to the folks measuring organic aerosol to, to explain to you. But I'm going to focus on the in inorganics because, as I mentioned, it's so tightly coupled to getting the reactive nitrogen chemistry correct. So here's a more quantitative version of what I was explaining to you before. 
Um, Hong Yu Guo from Rodney Weber's group um, put this together uh, showing um, the fraction of nitric acid partitioned to the aerosol uh, for two different conditions, 20 degrees Celsius and minus 20, and winter was in between these. Um, what you'll see is that for um, different liquid water contents and therefore different pHs, if you just take, say, this blue line here at pH 2, you have very little nitric acid in the particle phase at 20 degrees Celsius, but that same condition at minus 20 puts you at almost 80% of the nitric acid going in to the aerosol phase. So the temperature is a really large lever on the ammonium nitrate system. Um, so we used aerosol um, inorganics models. Um, so we're looking at chlorine partitioning, and Hong Yu Go was looking at um, nitrate partitioning. And what we find in winter is that, you know, roughly, if you look at these scales, um, measured aerosol nitrate, measured gas phase nitric acid, the scales are about the same, actually. So it's roughly 50-50. Of the aerosol, uh, of the total nitric acid is split into the aerosol phase and the gas phase. Um, <clears throat> so we, we feed into the aerosol thermodynamic model measured gas phase nitric acid and measured aerosol nitrate, as well as sulfate, ammonium, um, and other cations and, and anions into the model. And we ask at equilibrium what does the model suggest would be the partitioning? Um, and basically, the partitioning is calculated um, to be very similar to what was measured. These are one-to-one -one lines. So that would suggest that the thermodynamics for ammonium nitrate are, are fairly well known and that the observations were measured in a way that are consistent with the known thermodynamics from the laboratory. That does assume that we're getting the aerosol pH correct, which is not measured. Right? So in some ways, the fact that we're getting the observed partitioning correct suggests that um, we are getting the pH correct. That's the way I would interpret um, this pH. So it's not a measurement, but based on the fact that we are on average getting the partitioning correct of nitric acid, which is sensitive to pH, you can take this pH estimate then as a fairly robust measure. So the nitric acid is so sensitive to the pH over the range of the conditions of temperature that we, uh, uh, the temperature range that we measure during winter. <clears throat> so in, um, Geoschem is this aerosol thermodynamics module, isoropia, that I just showed you results from, and a box run in a sort of box model stands for every point on the uh, uh, aircraft flight track. And so we can then use Geoschem, which is emitting NOx, converting it into nitric acid through gas phase and multiphase processes, uh, and also doing the same for sulfate, converting SO2 emissions into sulfate through various mechanisms I'll talk about soon. And what you find um, or the observations of the inorganic aerosol component is that about half of the aerosol was sulfate and um, the other half was made up from ammonium and nitrate. Of course, um, those are all interacting together. And the model is actually predicting now with the correct N to a five chemistry and um, <clears throat> some improvements in the oxidative chemistry you'll talk about coming forward, but the point is, is that now we can use this model to assess how sensitive uh, are the model predictions to different pathways in, in different um, situations, perhaps changes to emissions in the future. So this is a remarkable result that I hadn't expected that we would come out of winter having near perfect agreement between a 3D global chemical transport model predictions since they've had such a hard time in the past. But this suggests now that these measurements that we made, as well as improvements to the model, are bringing our understanding, uh, you know, at least bringing us a little bit clearer understanding of what's happening to this system and what the, what the main drivers actually are. So this has been, a, 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 I think, a dramatic improvement in modeling, um, especially ammonium nitrate formation. So like I said, we can then break down uh, in the model what is going on in terms of the conversion of these different species. And, Essentially, um, of the submicron particulate mass, 95% uh, of it, according to the model, is formed in the atmosphere. So this is all secondary. Um, and uh, that's including, actually, the organic aerosol component. And you could argue that you take the breakdown of sulfate and nitrate in the, the processes which are involving multiphase chemistry of trace gases with aerosols or trace gases in clouds, that a third of that is due to multiphase processing. 
So a third of the aerosol mass is coming from multi-phase processing of trace gases. So for example, sulfur oxidation in cloud uh, by hydrogen peroxide and also by ozone and then also or, or transition metals is another you know, significant portion of that. And then N2O5 heterogeneous chemistry that I talked about for the nitrate component is more than half of the source of nitrate. So getting that pathway correct is really important for getting about a 20% of the total PM1 mass correct and about a third of the inorganic fraction of the mass correct. Okay, so <clears throat> I've sort of been sidestepping the fact that in the model there's not just multi-phase chemistry going on but also gas phase processing. Um, <clears throat> and the gas phase processing sets the conditions really for some of the multi-phase chemistry that might convert SO2 into sulfate, for example, supply of hydrogen peroxide or ozone, OH as a competitor in the gas phase. Um, and also then the conversion of NOx into nitric acid is going to depend on the OH abundance and um, its competition with the multi-phase pathway of N2O5. So to get, for example, the pH correct in the model, which sets how much nitric acid partitions to form ammonium nitrate, we have to get the oxidants um, correct in order to set the conversion of SO2 from the SO2 emissions into sulfate, either through cloud chemistry or gas-based processing. That sets the acidity. And then basically the ammonium nitrate system is a slave to that acidity set by the sulfate. Um, and then the, um, the lifetime of NOx or the fate of NOx is going to also depend on the supply of oxidants because it determines how much NOx can be converted into N2O5 by ozone and so on. And one of the guiding questions to winter was, what are the oxidant sources? What are the sources of the radicals that drive um, the free radical chemistry that we think of as during summertime? Uh, and how does that change going to winter? So this sort of canonical oxidant source um, <clears throat> is ozone photolysis to make O single D. O single D reacts with water to make OH. And um, in the wintertime conditions, especially in the cold wintertime conditions of 2015, the amount of water vapor is factors of 5 or 10 lower, um, at least. And the uh, radiation available to generate O single D is also lower. So this source of OH should be significantly lower in the wintertime than compared to the summer. And then that gives um, <clears throat> just that one being lower means that all the others that are also potential sources of radicals become relatively more important. And an example that we used um, all the way back in the white paper of, for winter was nitrile chloride photolysis to make chlorine atoms. And um, so we leveraged some work done by Noah, um, Steve Brown, <clears throat> and uh, Corey Young looking at nitrile chloride as a source of radicals compared to ozonolysis um, and put that into a simple box model here. That's this blue line. So this would be a dominant source of radicals, primary radicals throughout the day compared to the typical one ppb of nitrile chloride that was measured both on the ship and on the aircraft. <clears throat> um, so about 10% of the radical source during summertime in Los Angeles might be due to what we might consider an atypical source from nitrile chloride. But that same concentration of nitrile chloride in the winter in New York City, um, you, you make essentially a similar amount of, of radicals in the form of chlorine atoms in the morning time. But because the O single D source for, of OH has dropped so much, that now becomes potentially the dominant source of radicals. And we wanted to you know, test that scenario um, with the winter campaign and, and think about all the other possible radical sources um, that might also be present, molecular chlorine or HONO, formaldehyde, and so on. <clears throat> so here's an example of, of how we estimate, this is just the results, not really any raw data, but um, how we're estimating the magnitude of these different radical sources as, as follows. So we um, <clears throat> take a measurement of nitrile chloride. Its mixing ratio basically represents all the chlorine atoms that would be formed during the daytime, because this has, is a fairly short-lived species. It gets photolyzed before uh, noon, mostly. Um, and the same goes for HONO, unless there's recycling. So we, we basically ignore recycling for the most part, and we then just predict from the observed concentrations throughout the whole day how many radicals would that concentration lead to. And so we're using the in-situ observations of the concentrations and essentially a simple model to project how many radicals will be made from those. And what you find, for example, on this flight, 
Um, <clears throat> that was, I think this was flight three off the coast of Long Island and New York City and Massachusetts. Uh, that these sources um, in yellow here correspond to nitrile chloride. And as you get further downwind, the arrows are showing the general direction of this New York City corridor um, plume, we think, vecting. It could have some contribution from Boston as well. You'll notice that the sort of canonical one, ozone, is rather small most of the time, in that the nitrile chloride is growing as you get further and further downshore as the nighttime chemistry is evolving, producing more N2O5 and more N2O5 going through the aerosol phase to make nitrile chloride, such that by the furthest point downwind that we measured, nitrile chloride is half of the radical source that you would estimate for the next day. And if you assume, because we turned around and went back home uh, before half the night was over, actually, and you project forward how much NOx was left to keep con converting to N2O5 and into nitrile chloride, by the next morning, if everything evolved homogeneously without a whole lot of dilution, you would or deposition, you would have about 80% of the radical source being from nitrile chloride. So that's a very big difference than what's in GSChem now, which is almost zero nitrile chloride. <clears throat> so we can look at another flight, just um, we're not cherry picking. Whenever we were off shore over the water, nitrile chloride was a large fraction of the, the predicted daily radical source. Um, and when we're mostly over land, um, <clears throat> the con largest contribution was actually from formaldehyde. So formaldehyde, nitrile chloride, HONO, generally were always larger than, uh, as a sum, larger than um, ozone catalysis to make O singlet D. And no model is really getting HONO distributions right. And I just showed you that Geos Chem was not getting formaldehyde correct, um, and it's not getting nitrile chloride correct either. So there's a a lot of room for improvement of the model's description of radical sources during the daytime. And of course, these radical sources are not only different from ozone in the sense that they're not ozone, but they're also evolving differently during the, the, as the day evolves. So the timing of these radical sources is very different. And I should mention this is all within you know, the first kilometer or so of um, the atmosphere. We're not considering what's going on above the, kilometer, above the boundary layer. That's where you're dominated by ozonolysis for the most part. So it's basically that source, local or regional sources of NOx and formaldehyde or precursors of formaldehyde are dominating the lifetime of the trace gases through being the dominant sources of radicals. And this is just showing you here uh, the flight track for another flight that was, um, we were sampling a plume that had a nice high pressure episode that made this region fairly stagnant. And this we were able to basically capture some um, <clears throat> continental outflow that had been isolated and evolving over the night, um, essentially in the same spot. So we got there before sunrise, started making passes through the, the core of the plume. Um, so you can see enhancements in nitrile chloride concentrations reaching up to about a part per billion in the plume here every time we pass through. And then the sun started coming up and nitrile chloride started going down um, as we kept surveying that same region. And then in the shading here, we're calculating the radical contributions from these different precursors. And again, uh, nitrile chloride is dominating over ozonolysis, uh, sorry, ozone photolysis. And um, even HONO and formaldehyde are fairly suppressed on this flight. So this, um, again, on this particular flight, nitrile chloride was 80% of the radical source, again. So, so we add all, uh, basically average over the entire campaign. Um, we break it into continental flights and marine boundary layer flights. You find that um, about half of the radical source is due to formaldehyde in the continental regions, some contribution from HONO, but not a lot um, on average. And then um, as you get into more polluted air masses where we're just measuring polluted as being having higher and higher NOx, you get a higher and higher contribution from nitrile chloride. And that's consistent with having higher NOx going down the N2O5 pathway and making nitrile chloride, <clears throat> such that it's, again, explaining, you know, on average, about half of the radical source in these polluted air masses evolving offshore. So when we incorporate these radical sources into GS Chem, accounting for the fact that it was underestimating formaldehyde by at least a factor of two, if not more. Um, and 
tr adjusting the parameterization to get the mean nitrile chloride concentration offshore correct. And we put that into GeoSchem, we get, as you might expect, um, changes to the formation of um, radical limited products like sulfate, um, SOA, and the conversion of NOx, the lifetime of NOx. Um, we often talk about nitrile chloride being a reservoir for NOx and um, therefore increasing the lifetime of NOx downwind, but actually um, the increase of oxidants that you get shortens the lifetime of NOx, so you actually get a loss of NOx um, relative to a model that doesn't have nitrile chloride in it by you know 15%, so that's on the order of annual trends, 15% of NOx getting that right or wrong with nitrile chloride. Um, a lot of that NOx gets pushed into pan, um, in, in GeosChem. We don't really know if that's correct, although we do have some observations from winter that support there being a, needing to be a higher source of PAN in the model because the model is currently underestimating peroxynitrates. And then we get general enhancements in the regional SOA and, as I mentioned, sulfate by 15 to 20 percent in some cases, even more. And that's illustrating this tight coupling that I mentioned at the beginning that in order to get sulfate right, you have to get the oxidants right and you need to get sulfate right to get the pH of the aerosol right, and you need to get the pH of the aerosol right to get the partitioning of nitric acid correct, and to get nitric acid correct, you have to get the fate of NOx right. right? So all of this is so tightly coupled together and that it's not a surprise that this has been a challenge to get it right with um, large-scale models that have often had to simplify in order to, to operate um, but, uh, or not have guidance from observations until now. So I'm going to conclude um, with some implications. So I mentioned this tight coupling between gas phase pollutants, oxidants, multiphase chemistry, and secondary aerosol. In this oxidative capacity, at least in polluted air near the surface, is controlled by the regional anthropogenic emissions of NOx. So NOx is the source of nitrile chloride, which is, we think, uh, in, at least in the marine boundary layer, being a major fraction of the source of radicals. It's also a source of HONO, of course. Um, and then emissions of short-lived precursors to formaldehyde are essentially another major fraction of the radical source. So it's the local emissions, or local on a regional scale, <laughs> regional emissions are essentially setting the lifetime of these primary emissions of sulfur and NOx in their conversion into um, secondary aerosol. Um, so we can take this understanding and project forward um, to note that sulfate, and I didn't, I'm not really showing you evidence, but I, I can. Um, I showed you at the beginning of the talk that summertime PM 2.5 loadings have come down substantially, um, factor of three or something like that. Um, <clears throat> but wintertime ha has not come down and maybe even gone up, right? And even, that's, even though emissions of NOx and SO2 have come down as well substantially over the past decade, as I showed in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> and the coupling between sulfate and nitrate basically dictates that it's going to be very hard to achieve reductions in PM2.5 in the wintertime going forward, even as NOx and SO2 emissions decrease, because <clears throat> right now in the wintertime, or it has been the case that SO2 emissions were high enough to basically titrate away any hydrogen peroxide that was available to oxidize it. Right? And then you had excess SO2 left over. As the SO2 comes down, a larger fraction gets oxidized to sulfate. Um, but as the pH goes up, if sulfate goes down, more nitrate piles in. Right? So you get a larger fraction of the available NOx going into the aerosol as nitrate, sustaining basically in a somewhat of a buffered system the ammonium nitrate replacing ammonium sulfate. And that um, has been shown before, and our winter observations are, are supporting that um, context uh, where in the future, even by 2020, we might even see an increase in PM2.5 in the wintertime over the eastern United States. So that means we're going to need even stronger reductions of emissions of NOx and SO2 going forward to start bringing down PM2.5 levels in the wintertime. So there is an opportunity, um, something I didn't talk about, actually, uh, in the form of organic aerosol. Um, so it's going to be really hard to get sulfate and nitrate aerosol in the wintertime to come down substantially. Um, but there is an opportunity to try and address 
anthropogenic sources of organic aerosol as a way to bring down about a third of the aerosol uh, mass. And I think there I will stop and take questions and give a special thanks to the pilots whose shadows you can see here, um, two of them anyways, um, and all the RAF and UL folks who helped out um, during winter. And thanks for listening. And I'll take questions by later. So most people know that we typically try and use the microphone so that anybody listening remotely can hear the question and um, when you answer it. So anyway, any questions? Hi, thanks, Joel. This is Ned. Uh, I was just wondering uh, if GSCAM has a model for wind speed dependence of uh, sea spray sources, and is that something you've looked into in terms of uh, those rates and the changing therein? Uh, so it does have a wind speed dependent um, and temperature dependent sea spray source, sea surface temperature dependent um, <coughs> source of sea spray, and that's incorporated into the model. Um, you know where the connection is uh, looser than it should be is uh, the coupling between sea spray aerosol and the gas phase um, processes affecting chlorine partitioning amongst the entire size distribution. So that getting the sea spray chloride throughout the entire size distribution or where we observe it and how we observe it, I think, is still an open question. Um, and that's something that a student of mine is working on, the chloride partitioning. Um, just like I showed you nitric acid partitioning, is to try and understand the budget of reactive chlorine in the polluted marine boundary layer because you have displacement going on and you have fresh sea spray going in at the same time, um, and you're trying to then apply an equilibrium model to the partitioning of, of chloride. So that, I mean, it looks reasonable uh, on the sort of 50% level, um, but we probably want to do even better than that to get the nitro, nitro chloride um, branching correct in the model. Uh, so there's a recent paper indicating that ocean is pretty much like a net sink for sail no. 2. Uh, that pretty much limits how far this reservoir for NOx and uh, radicals can transport. I wonder, like, you have flights like cover the, the transport of the plumes. Do you see any evidence or how big of the inf impact of the ocean deposition of sail no. 2 on the transport of these things? Uh, yeah, so the question about deposition... Um, is a very good one, and it's one that we are thinking about. Um, we haven't done anything quantitative with the winter data. I, mean, I actually have a student looking at eddy fluxes from the aircraft of uh, N205, CLNO2, and nitric acid over the water. It's a very challenging, uh, maybe even impossible, to extract that information from this type of flight, the, the flight tracks that we had, and also the conditions of winter are, are not necessarily supportive for being able to measure eddy fluxes very well. Um, but the, the information that's there, so Tim Bertram's group has put out a paper showing that nitric chloride is depositing, or at least is not coming out of the ocean, um, for example, and N205 is also deport, uh, depositing, and that's in the winter t uh, summertime context. Uh, but there's really not any direct observations of deposition of these species to the ocean. Um, but that it, if you assume um, reasonable deposition velocities in a well-mixed boundary layer, then nitro chloride should be depositing with a time scale of you know, maybe half the night, sort of lifetime. Um, and so that would impact using observations of nitro chloride to extract information on that branching that's going on in the atmosphere. And if nitro chloride is depositing, well, so should N205. The question is, how well mixed is the marine boundary layer at night in wintertime, and how does that change as you evolve away from the cold uh, land out over the, in the wintertime, warmer ocean water? And so that's something we're trying to look at with the winter data, uh, but it's, it's an open question. And the only thing I can tell you is that one of these flights that we've looked at seems to be well mixed enough to do the analysis, and everything is, there is a downward flux of all three of those species, N205. Nitric acid and, and nitro chloride uh, with pretty substantial deposition velocities. So I would say we can't neglect it even in the wintertime. I'm also curious, like the source of 
chloride, particularly chloride or HCl. I mean, especially the direct emission of HCl from the power plants. How big of a role compared to like particularly chloride? Um, so is the question about how, how much particulate chloride is emitted from a power plant or? I mean, like the relative importance uh, of, of the power plant emi emission of HCl. So I think other... inland, um, inland, it's going to be uh, substantial, especially in the Ohio River Valley, where you, you're pretty disconnected from sea spray sources. Um, and there's quite a few coal-fired power plants. So we've incorporated the, um, the ratio of HCl to SO2 from the power plant plumes that we've we measured in winter. We've, we've sort of scaled the national emissions inventory um, database for HCl to the, the line that we essentially observed in winter, and then put that into HCL. And uh, we have a map of HCL that a student will present on at HEU. And it, um, it, it's getting close, again, within a sort of factor of two of the background HCL in the Ohio River Valley could be explained. You know, Half of it could be explained maybe just from the power plant emissions of HCL. So the partitioning of HCL in, into the particulate chloride is actually um, a little bit trickier because in inland you will have, and especially in the higher river valley, you have a higher sulfate loading, so the pH is quite a bit lower, and that in HCl is predicted by the thermodynamic models to be mostly in the gas phase and not in the particle phase. So it's a very small partitioning of chloride into the aerosol in those regions. So you'd expect much lower uh, branching of N2O5 into nitrile chloride just for that reason. Even though there might be a supply of HCl, the production rate of CL92 will be a lot slower because there's not a lot of chloride in the aerosol. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions? Steve? If I'm allowed to, I'll make one. You look like you're anxious. I just didn't want to steal the microphone because I've seen a lot of this stuff already. But um, Joel, I, I hear you say a few things about formaldehyde, like it's the largest radical source in almost any environment where you look at it, and that um, you're careful to put forward a caveat that it should be considered either as a direct emission or as some uh, secondary product of some rapidly evolving source. But um, I guess I would like to put in a plug for that being a major and unexpected result out of this whole study, and also that um, I would be less shy about calling this a direct emission, even though some people think direct emissions of formaldehyde are a dirty word. Um, I think we have some good evidence for this, and I think it's worth pursuing that one further. Yes, uh, I think some, it should be pursued a lot uh, more than we have, and, um, and some simple measurements would go a long way. Uh, for, you know, from behind a tailpipe. Uh, but I, it, my caveats are in the context of using GeosChem as the integrator of the observations um, that on the, the sort of grid scale of GeosChem, we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a direct emission and, uh, you know, a formaldehyde and the conversion of something that's short-lived into formaldehyde. You get very quickly into a chicken and egg. It's like, well, you need formaldehyde to get fast oxidation or at least reasonably fast oxidation so, you know, I, in some way, I, I certainly agree with you that, to me, it smells like direct emissions of formaldehyde. Um, but I, you know, the tool that we're using to get at that answer is, is maybe not the best. And, and I, I can show you correlations of, and I can show everyone, you've seen these, um, uh, of what we have, formaldehyde with tracers of combustion CO. but. Um, the problem you, you run in with so formaldehyde is very tightly coupled to methane and CO in regions where those are related to transportation and or point source emissions. <clears throat> but lots of things are correlated in the, the, in the wintertime boundary layer. So that is, and especially the way we're flying some of the flights, you get a correlation by dipping down into the boundary layer at night and so on. So you know these things. So it's a little bit hard to defend that it's direct emissions from that evidence alone. I think a simple box model uh, could go a long way to supporting this, that it's not direct, uh, it's not conversion of something short-lived, it's actually direct emissions. Um, and I'm hoping that some of our collaborators will, will continue to work on that, and I'm told they are working on that. So, Collaborators who shall not be named. Yes, <laughs> not in public. Yeah. Somebody in the back there. 
When you talk about using a, a box model or a simple box model at, at night, are you and and you talk about well mixed profiles? Are you talking about what you think are emissions that are emitted during the day and get well mixed at these remote distances you're measuring? But plumes from say strong point sources will be elevated at that point, most likely, depending on how far downwind you are. So I, I'm wondering, what are you talking about here? Yeah, so I should, you know, for formaldehyde, I would I use our daytime flights, where we were able to be in a boundary layer that was fairly well connected to the surface, uh, at least part of the time. Um, and, you know, we would, you'd want to focus on periods where you had vertical profiles, which suggested that you were well next to the surface. I wouldn't want to necessarily use nighttime observations of formaldehyde because you will get these correlations um, that are not necessarily from chemistry. But it sort of depends on you know how what what chemistry can we study in this context of the winter time not having a well mixed boundary layer. And the, you know the answer is it sort of depends on what we're asking. So as you're going across, uh, if you're looking at w pollution being transported or, out over the water in this. Most of these flights, we found a pretty well mixed layer at night, down as low as the aircraft would fly, 300 feet in some cases. And so, in that context, the pollution being mixed out, as you get far enough offshore that you don't have the, the coastal influence, things got pretty well mixed. And whatever was affecting down beyond that was a well mixed plume, I would argue, um, for, you know, at least within the boundary layer to the surface. And we have some evidence of that. But yeah, you have to pick and choose in this context. It's not all. Uh, flights were in a well-mixed polluted boundary layer. Yeah. yeah, I can understand that yeah. with respect to over the ocean, but right. y you were talking about Ohio Valley plumes and things like that, so that's a, there's a long transport distance in time before you get to the ocean. Right, yeah, yeah. and so we, yeah, we'd have to look at some of the daytime flights in that region that we did. So we, we have some nighttime flights, and uh, you know, interpreting those as being well-mixed is obviously wrong, you know, flawed, and we, you wouldn't want to do that. But there were some, also some daytime flights uh, in that same region that we, we followed up on um, with nighttime flights and so on. So you'd want to go and do the daytime flights that we have and, and look at the evolution over time there. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, let's thank Joel again.